Well, good morning, Church of the City. Uh, as you can tell, we are wintering hard right now, and all the forecasts told me that right about now is when it was all going to hit. So for, for that reason, uh, we are meeting together online, all of our congregations together. One, one of the concerns we have is that we just don't have the equipment to clear parking lots while the event is happening. So, But because of the wonders of technology, here we are, linked up around the city with all of our beautiful congregations worshipping together. So I want to say a really great good morning to the fine folks of Church of the City, Spring Hill. So proud of the work that you guys are doing in, in leading your community in, in mental health. Uh, I want to say hi to all the folks from Franklin at Exit 65. Off the 65, you, you're leading our state in response to foster care. We love you so much. And of course, my favorites up in uh, Church City downtown on the southern loop of, of the city. We love you guys and we look forward to being together very soon. Well, here we are, day 16 of the Fast. I'm sure all sorts of things uh, are happening to all of us. I hope that you are feeling God close. I also suspect that uh, different emotions are bubbling to the surface as, as we deal with abstaining from certain things in our lives uh, that we lean on in, instead of the Holy Spirit. And I just encourage you, whatever's coming out, if it's anger or sadness or loneliness, that you take this extra time to talk with Jesus about it, uh, to abide with Jesus like he is your friend and talk about what you were feeling in, in this beautiful season that we're in together. And at the end of this, the promise of scripture, of course, uh, uh, after a life abiding in the vine of staying close with the Holy Spirit, that, that we'll see beautiful fruit, that we be people who are loving and kind and patient and gentle. Wouldn't that be something if the world would look at Christians and instead of thinking immediately of words like hypocrites or, or bigots, they go, you know what? Those are the people who are loving, kind and patient and joyful. And that's exactly where this journey leads uh, to the best possible way of being human, of us finding tremendous peace and patience and joy in our lives. So I encourage you on this journey uh, till the 21st. Let's stay in this together. Let's abide with Jesus because there is wonderful fruit coming. Let's stand together as we sing.
time, come move. So come move, let justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you.
I'm flying this place and feel the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are well.
Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was fine Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth above Shall not kneel, shall not faint By His love and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me Oh, we praise you, Lord Praise the Father Praise the Lord Oh, we praise you, Holy Spirit Oh, we want Oh, God of glory Majesty Praise forever to the King of kings Oh, praise the Father Oh, we praise you, Lord Praise God of glory Majesty Praise forever to the King of kings Praise forever to the King of kings Praise forever to the King of kings Show me your face Fill up this space My world needs you right now My world needs you right now I can't escape Being afraid Fill me with you My world needs you right now Power fall down Bring with it a sound That points us to you right now Erase substitutes right now Fix what I see And God please fix me Fill me with you right now Let us see you right now Storms may come But when we go Your name All things All things change Say the anchor that holds me, you say. Change. We're never changed.
Well, good morning, guys. Jonathan Pitts here. I'm one of the pastors here on the staff. And uh, if we've never met before, I would look forward to meeting you at some point here on campus. But um, I know half of you guys have moved here just recently, but I've been around for a couple of years. But glad to have you with us this morning. And if you're tuning in for the very first time with us, uh, welcome. Welcome to Church of the City. I wanted to start by just saying I am blown away uh, by God's kindness to our church and uh, just the way that God has moved, uh, even financially through our church. If you think about the village campaign where our church has just raised an incredible amount of money, but God's done that through the obedience and faithfulness of our body, of all of you guys and me and all of us together collectively being obedient. And uh, one of the things I I first want to do is just offer you an opportunity this morning, if you want to give um, and be faithful to God's call to give, which is why we offer this opportunity out, um, then you can do that at churchofthecity.com or cotc.com forward slash give. You can give by going there. Second, I want to let you know, um, if you're not already signed up for COT Daily, uh, we have a daily devotional that we do as a church that we want you to have, and it can be dropped right into your lap or right into your phone. You can sign up to COTC Daily, COTC Daily Devotionals by texting COTC Daily to 855-615-6150. Again, that's COTC Daily to 855-615-6150. Also, if you want to learn about upcoming events, if you go to churchofthecity.com, when you get there, if you've not been to the, to the site before, it allows you to, to, to select your location, either downtown or Franklin or Spring Hill. You can select your church and you can find out about all the different events we have going on there. We want you to be going to the page often, or if you have the app, go there, because we want to make sure that you know about what's happening for you and for your family. And as you know, or most of you know, we're in the last week of our 21-day fast. Um, It's, you know, 21 days is a long time to start the year, but we do it committed to God and committed to offering him our best and reminding ourselves really of the things that we don't need and the things that distract us. And for me, every single year, it's a reset opportunity for me. I never have anything um, really massive happen, but I reset my desire for the Lord and remind myself that the desires that I have for other things, whether it be food or television or you name the thing, that those things aren't necessary in my life. And so I'm grateful. My hope is that God's speaking to you um, in this time as you've fasted and um, prayed and, and uh, allowed God to kind of have the priority, main priority in your life. But um, in this last week, uh, Friday, uh, on the 21st, we're going to actually in downtown and Franklin, we're going to be hosting um, an evening of worship and prayer. And we would love for you to be, be there with us. And one of the things that we're going to do specially there is have our prayer team available for you. And we'd love if you'd come, if there's prayers that you've been praying, if there are um, th- desires of your heart that you've been just really knocking for, Um, with the Lord, uh, we'd love for you to bring those with you. Come pray, come worship, but then also come and um, maybe um, pray with one of our prayer team members for something that's a little bit more personal. Um, We really love to give you that opportunity just to spend some up close and personal time um, in prayer on Friday night. So we welcome you there as well. And uh, lastly, I have the great privilege um, to introduce a a good friend of mine. And before I introduce him, I want to share a couple things um, uh, just to kind of set it up. And first of all, it's, it's Martin Luther King Jr. It's Martin Luther King weekend, and Martin Luther King Day is tomorrow, and we celebrate the life and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. But we as a church are committed, in addition to just celebrating that because of the, the nature of the gospel reconciliation that, that he led, um, we're also just committed to unity and we're committed to formation of people. And some of you guys that were here will remember uh, back in May of uh, 2020, the George Floyd um, incident had happened, and we as a church were um, mourning and grieving with our brothers and sisters that really felt close to that. And we as a pastoral team weren't exactly sure how to walk in that, and uh, we knew uh, there was a man who did and who has spent the majority of his life's work really invested in um, reconciliation and the multi-ethnic church, and that's Brian Loritz. And um, we, we had Brian come in back in June of 2020 and just share. He sat down on the stage with Pastor Darren and they talked um, much about what was happening in our t- country and mainly about how we as believers were to respond. You know, the world was doing all kinds of stuff. It felt like our nation was really on fire in a way. And um, we were trying to understand what do we do as a church and what do we do as believers in this moment. And so Pastor Darren and Brian sat down and had a conversation on the stage and Brian brought a ton of wisdom and uh, a gospel-centered approach to how to press into um, reconciliation, how to press into grieving with those who grieve and, grieve and mourning with those who mourn. And um, as we thought about MLK Day and we thought about how to celebrate and how to remember, but also how to continue to have a gospel-centered approach as a church, 
we thought that there wouldn't be any better opportunity to start that conversation this weekend than by having Brian come um, really teach us. And so my prayer, and I'm going to pray in a second here, is that we would really open our, our ears and our minds to what the Holy Spirit might want to say to us through his message today. So if you guys would pray with me. Father, we just thank you so much for just the opportunity that we have to gather, God. And we thank you, Lord, that your heart is always for reconciliation, God. Your heart is always for um, uh, the development and the bettering of relationships, first of all, with you, God, but then second of all, with each other. And so we just pray, Lord, I pray that as this message is brought, God, I pray against anything the enemy would try to do to kind of divide our focus or divide our minds. And Lord, I just pray we'd open our ears to what your spirit is saying to each of us, God. Divide this message thousands of different ways for each of us. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you guys wouldn't mind helping me from your living rooms, welcome Pastor Brian Leritz. Well, good morning, Church of the City family. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to meet me in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, as you're making your way there, let me just say thank you, thank you, thank you to Pastor Darren, Pastor Jonathan for the wonderful invitation to, to come and to share with you on this wonderful weekend where we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Obviously, Jesus Christ is front and center, and so I want to offer some thoughts about what Dr. King was actually for, spent his life doing, that is, this whole idea of reconciliation. But I want to offer those thoughts through a very gospel lens, which Ephesians 2 is going to help me. I, I've got to say this, I, I go back some years with, uh, with Pastor, uh, Pastor Jonathan, and uh, I had actually pastored for 12 wonderful years here in the state of Tennessee. I'm in North Carolina now, where they've got this kind of fake barbecue that's vinegar-based oh my gosh, that will not be at the Feast of the New Covenant. So I was so excited to get here uh, and to get some real Tennessee barbecue. Uh, Jonathan said, well, what are you thinking about doing for, for lunch? And I was hoping that he was going to take me after uh, our time together to some good Tennessee barbecue. And so that's what I said to him. And he said, I hate barbecue. Now that's, if ever there's a case for church discipline, I think that's, that's the case. So please pray for Pastor Jonathan that God would anoint his, his palate. Ephesians chapter 2, here we go. Pick me up in verse 1. Let me just read the whole chapter to us, offer some thoughts, and we can continue along our way. Paul writes these words. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and I love this, and were by nature children of wrath. Now, if I was preaching this text in the 90s, I would title it, Naughty by Nature. I, I didn't think you would get that. Anyways, like the rest of mankind, verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And then he repeats it, verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, Greek word poema, from which we get the English word poem. I, 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 always, I always just think of my mother when I think of Paul's words, that we are his workmanship. My mother was born out of wedlock, inner city Philadelphia. Uh, her mother had already had one abortion, and yet for reasons known only to God, my grandmother decided not to have an abortion. She gives birth. That's my mother. My mother gets saved by grace through faith. We are his workmanship, his, his poema, created on purpose, for a purpose. What is that purpose? For good works, he says, verse 10, which God prepared beforehand 
we should walk in them. Therefore, verse 11, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he, speaking of Christ himself, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, make note of this phrase, one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers. And aliens, you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom, verse 21, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Will you pray with me one more time? God, thank you. Thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. I understand, Lord God, that those who are are tuning in, who are participating, they they come from various places, maybe on the spiritual continuum. Maybe some grew up in the church, and their testimony uh, is came to you at an early age, been walking with you for decades. But but then there are others, Lord God, they, they are tuning in, and they wouldn't know you to be Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that your gospel would would have something to say about the profound love that you have for us and now that love that we share for others. God, in this season where we are specifically focusing on this idea of asking, we are asking that your gospel would rescue people today. We are asking that your gospel would push us to view wherever we live as our mission field, and that it would be used in such a way that we are instruments of reconciliation, drawing people to you, and then us living in unity with people who don't even look like, act like, think like, or vote like us. Your gospel's that powerful. Use me, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a verse that I think every single adult uh, should be able to quote to their still living parents. Uh, it's a verse tucked away in Proverbs 13, 22. Whenever I'm with my dad, I, I always share this verse with him. I tell him, I got a word for you, dad. Proverbs 13, 22, it simply says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I, I'll say that to my father, and then I always say a bit tongue in cheek, uh, dad, are you a good man? I remember some years ago, you know, I'm having a good time ribbing my dad with this. We're sitting down at a cheesecake factory not too far from where he lives on the north side uh, there of Atlanta. Uh, I said, Dad, Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Dad, are you a good man? And he, he then says to me, true story, he says, son, it's funny you should bring that up now. I've just made some changes to the will. Now, you got to imagine, my, my father now has my attention. Uh, changes to your will, uh, pray tell, what changes have you made? He says, it's interesting, son, here we are in the state of Georgia. He said, uh, sit down with my lawyer. My lawyer says, Dr. Loritz, we're so excited to go over uh, these edits to your will. Before we get started, you need to understand something. I, I see you have four kids. Three of them are biological. One of them is adopted. You need to understand, before we make these changes, Uh, Georgia state law stipulates that at any given moment, you can write out, you can amend out of your will, your biological kids, but Georgia state law also stipulates that at no given point ever can you amend out of your will that adopted child, that adopted child is secure. 
We come now to the book of Ephesians, and Ephesians is a stunning view as Paul sets out on what the church looks like and and what the gospel looks like. And in chapter 1, he says, for those of us who have placed our faith, not in the amount of quiet times we've had, not in our giving record, not in our moral choices, but for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God. I got to confess that for a lot of ignorant years, there was this subconscious thing in me that I kind of thought adoption was second class. And yet Paul, right on the heels of saying we've been adopted, he then says we've been sealed by the precious Holy Spirit. The idea of the sealing of the Spirit, it's the idea of security so that adoption is not second-class citizenship. It is first-rate security. We have been adopted into the family of God. So what does that look like? How does that specifically happen, and what is that actually look like? These are questions I want to entertain with us for the balance of our time together. Now we come to chapter 2, and Paul says, here's how that happened. That happened because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He lays out before us the stunning beauty of what the gospel looks like in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. But before Paul can get to the good news of the gospel, he begins with some very bad news. He says in verse 1, that prior to us being saved by grace through faith, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Before Paul gets to the good news of the gospel, he begins with the bad and bleak news of our sins. Now, I remember when I was in seminary many years ago, uh, I was po, not poor, Poe. I couldn't afford the other O and the R. And uh, I was in love. I was in love with the woman who's now my who's now my wife, bad combination. It's bad to be Poe and in love. But, but, but I, I knew pretty quickly that uh, this was the one God wanted me to spend my life with. And so uh, because I was Poe, I was looking um, for jewelers who had a layaway plan. I, I know I just lost a whole ton of you. What layaway is, don't have time to explain that. And, um, and my, my girl at the time had given me uh, the, the specs of the diamond that she was looking for. And so I remember walking to these jewelers and giving them the specs of the diamonds. And, and I remember they'd come out with these diamonds, they would never take these diamonds and just plop them down on the counter. What they would always do first is they would take a black piece of velvet cloth, roll out that black piece of velvet cloth, and then put the diamonds on top of the black velvet cloth, and it would only make the diamonds radiate all the more. That is exactly what Paul is doing in Ephesians 2. He is laying out the brilliance and the radiance of the diamond of the gospel, but before he can get to the brilliance of the diamond, he has to lay out the the black piece of velvet cloth known as our sin. He says, I don't ever want you to forget that before Christ, you were dead. Not just in your dysfunction, not just in your issues, but you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and had, that we had walked in sin following the course of this world, that, that we had once lived in them. We, we were, hear it now, by nature children of wrath. Now, wait a minute. You may be asking, wait a minute, Brian. I, I thought God loved us, but now you're saying that we were children of his wrath? How can God love us and be angry with us at the same time? You must not have kids. Because if you've got kids, you know, can't nobody tick you off like the ones you love. In fact, as the great rabbi, Abraham Joshua Heschel, who marched with Dr. King at Selma, Abraham Joshua Heschel would say that The opposite of hate isn't anger. The opposite of hate is actually indifference. Any therapist will tell you that one of the indicator lights of what we love, what we are concerned about is anger. The fact that God doesn't look flippantly at Brian's sin, but actually it gets angry over it. It is a profound indicator light of his love for me. 
Here we are, living in sin, headed down a one-way street, destined for an eternity in hell, separated from God. And then verse 4, but God, cue the Hammond B3 organ. If I was in a chocolate church, we would be having some church right now. But God, and I love it, not just having mercy, but Paul says that God is rich in mercy. Oh, friends, God has more mercy than we have mess. There's no sin we can ever commit, no amount of times we can ever commit it that will make God's mercy account show insufficient funds. God is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. And then he goes on to say at the end of verse 5 that it is by grace you have been saved. There's a guy by the name of Matt Chandler, and I love Matt Chandler's definition of grace. Matt Chandler says simply, grace means you didn't eat your dinner, but you still get dessert. Grace means you didn't eat your dinner, but you still get dessert. It, it, is, it is God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. Uh, I, I was an okay student. I used to drive my, my parents nuts. I, uh, I was just an academic underachiever. My, my whole thing was, let me just do the bare minimum, what is barely acceptable to my folks, and then let me just kind of get out of it. Because of that, when I graduated college, I didn't graduate, I didn't graduate summa cum laude. I didn't graduate magna cum laude. I just graduated thank you laude. Now, that's a problem because now I go to grad school. I go to, I go to seminary, and uh, my dad told me that college was a partnership between me, him, and Jesus, and that seminary was just going to be me and Jesus. And so because I didn't really perform well in college academically, uh, and I was po again, what was I to do? Well, I ended up, long story short, getting a scholarship called the SIRS Scholarship, the Scholarship for Under-Resourced and represented students. I, I hate to admit this, I got a scholarship for something I, I have no control over. I, I got a scholarship based on the color of my skin. I don't like admitting that because there's no boasting in that. You know what the boasting is? The boasting is in merit-based scholarships. The boasting is me saying, I got a 4.0 in, in, in college, I graduated summa cum laude, kept that 4.0 in grad school, didn't pay a dime, I, I, I earned my way in, and, and I kept my way in. That's where the boasting is. If this illustration bothers you, then you need to know what Paul is saying. In the kingdom of God, there are no merit-based scholarships. You didn't earn your way in, and you can't white-knuckle your way to keep yourself in. Saved by grace through faith. Every Friday night in our home is, is family night. One of my favorite games to play uh, for family night is Monopoly. Nothing gives me greater joy than to bankrupt my kids. Absolutely love it. I, I just love at the end of Monopoly, looking at my stash, all the houses, all the hotels, all the cash, and these knuckleheads have nothing. Uh, kind of a pretty uh, fitting and accurate metaphor for their true financial state. But, but you know what? At the end of Monopoly, one thing I've never done I've never taken all that Monopoly money and gone to Bank of America to make a deposit. You understand why, don't you? Because while Monopoly money has value within the realm of Monopoly, it carries no value within the realm of this world. Listen, I imagine that some of you listening in, you've maybe accomplished some very significant things within the realm of this world. 
You may be highly degreed. You, you may be some very accomplished artist or musician. Uh, you, you may have the coveted blue check on social media. Uh, you, you may have done well in the business world. You may have achieved a lot. And that's wonderful and that's great. And that may curry you a lot of favor in this world, in the realm of this life. But in the kingdom of heaven, it means nothing. The fact that you've made maybe some right moral decisions doesn't curry you any favor with God. It's monopoly money to think that the letters behind my name, the zip code, where I live, my academic success and achievement, where I work, how much money I make means anything. No, friends, there will be very rich people. In hell, there will be virgins. In hell, I am not saved by my tax bracket or my church affiliation. I am saved by grace through faith. Now, chances are, maybe, you know, look, I'm down south, so maybe some of you can say, I grew up churched. Chances are, maybe you've heard, like me, a million messages on Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, which is all about vertical reconciliation and what the gospel has done. And man, this is wonderful stuff, and it is great stuff. Yes and amen. Never get so sophisticated in your faith that you fail to be wowed by the lengths to which God has gone to pursue you. But I got to tell you, most conservative evangelicals act as if Ephesians 2 only has 10 verses. Paul ain't done. Right on the heels of talking about the glories of the gospel, saved by grace through faith, God being rich in mercy. He says in verse 11, therefore, <laughs> therefore, let me stop you right here. You don't have to spend a day in the seminary to figure this out. Therefore simply means that what I am about to say is connected to what I've just said. Okay, Paul, what are you about to say? He says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles, hear it now, in the flesh. Let me stop you right there. If you read Paul's letters, you know that there's two major ways he uses the term Gentiles. Oftentimes, he uses the word Gentiles to, to merely speak of people who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In fact, this is exactly what he's going to do one chapter later, excuse me, two chapters later in chapter 4. But then there are other times when Paul uses the word Gentiles not so much spiritually as much as he's talking ethnically and sociologically. This is exactly how Paul is using it in our text. How do we know this? Again, we don't have to spend a day in seminary to figure this out. He says, therefore, remember that at one time, hear it now, you Gentiles in the flesh. Watch it now. Paul, right on the heels of talking about everything that God has done for us through Christ on the cross, now talks about race. Wow. This is not critical race theory. This isn't woke theology. This isn't cultural Marxism. This is Bible. He says, I, I, I just want to talk about how the glorious gospel comes to bear not just on your human relationships, but on your ethnically different human relationships. In order to get this, we have to understand a little bit about how Paul understood the church. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, again, if you grew up in church, this, this is a familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, oftentimes, we quote it evangelistically as well we should, but we should also hear it sociologically. Romans 1, 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe, hear it now, not to the Jew only, 
but to the Jew first and also the Greek. This now becomes Paul's missiological methodology when he goes to plant churches. If you study Paul in the book of Acts, whenever he goes to plant a church, he always asks two questions. Number one, where's the synagogue? I, I, I want to see some Jews come to faith in Jesus Christ. I, I want to preach the gospel to them. But then when he's done, he's not finished. He goes, where did the Gentiles hang out? In Acts 17, Athens, they, they say up on Mars Hill. In Acts 19, it's the Hall of Tyrannus. Again, what, what we've been emphasizing here at Church of the City is this whole idea of asking. Here's what I want you to understand. Why does Paul deal so profoundly with the issue of race? Not just because it is a cool, progressive agenda. It has nothing to do with ideology. It has nothing to do with politics. Paul is filled with gospel greed, which means this. He doesn't just want to see a part of his city come to know Christ. He doesn't just want to see a zip code in his city come to know Christ. He's filled with a gospel greed in which he wants to see everybody come to know Jesus Christ. In fact, what is driving all of this for Paul is a deep and rich missiology. So friends, I just got to ask you, if we claim to have been saved by a universal gospel where Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, and how did Jesus Christ come here? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And what does our future eternal reality look like? Revelation chapter 5, <clears throat> chapter 5, where there are people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And we've got to ask... God, I want to see everyone around our three campuses. I want to see everyone in our mission field come to know Christ as Lord and Savior and hear me. When you ask that question, you are opening yourself up for some profound racial and ethnic implications which the gospel speaks profoundly about. Now you must understand here is Paul, Acts chapter 19. Luke says he is reasoning with Jews and Gentiles. Some Jews come to faith in Jesus Christ. Some Gentiles come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now he has a problem because these two groups don't like each other. So what does he do? Well, if he was following the church growth scholars of the mid to late 20th century, he would have started two churches, one on the north side of town for the Gentiles, one on the south side of town for the Jews, but he doesn't do that. He says, no, I'm starting one church, and I'm putting you two ethnically different people together in one church, and I'm calling you to work out horizontally what God in Christ has already accomplished for you on the cross vertically. In other words, Paul was never satisfied with diversity. What he was after was ethnic unity. When you get people together and they're rallying around the cross of Jesus Christ who are ethnically different, the multi-ethnic church is one of the richest, deepest, most vibrant apologetics for the veracity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the power of the gospel. Now, Paul, why do you do that? I want to end with two broad points. Paul, why are you so passionate about seeing people of different ethnicities come together? Verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall, the dividing wall, the dividing wall of hostility. Here's Paul, and he's making a reference now to the temple. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you understand that the temple is filled with several courts, four courts to be exact. The outermost court is the court of the Gentiles. It was the only place where, where God fears and proselytes, these Gentiles, could come to worship God. In fact, that was the place where, where Jews had set up their religious wares and where Jesus drove them out. In Matthew chapter 21, parenthetically, I believe the reason why Jesus is so upset when he's driving these people out of the temple is not just for commercial reasons. That's a part of it. But I also think Jesus 
Jesus is reacting to an insidious form of racism. Why? Because when he drives them out, he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. It's not done for all nations. It was as if these religious leaders were saying, huh, who cares? We can set up our place here. Who cares about the Gentiles? Jesus is reacting to racism. So you had the court of the Gentiles, next court, court of women, next court, court of the Israelites, and then the next court, the court of the priests. Between each court were these partitions. In the late 1800s, they actually found the partition separating the court of Gentiles from the other courts, and on it were etched words to this extreme, proceed no further upon fear of death. Paul says the cross of Jesus Christ served as a sledgehammer, demolishing the dividing wall of hostility. The, the imagery is poignant. Now we can rush in together worship with one another. Friends, I hate to say this. I think the Church of Jesus Christ in America historically, I think we get an A plus for resurrecting what Christ has already torn down. Martin Luther King Jr. popularized the sentiment. He talks about the 11 o'clock hours, the most segregated hour of the week. I think the reason why the 11 o'clock hour is the most segregated hour is because the six o'clock dinner hour around our tables is the most segregated hour. I tell people all the time, if people are still primarily coming to church out of relationships, then sanctuaries reflect dinner tables. Can I ask you something? What does your dinner table look like? What does that look like? I can tell you some of the richest friends that I have, in fact, you know, 2020 happens, George Floyd happens. Um, one of my sons is sitting there in the living room with us as a family, he's seething in anger and he's starting to go in about how all white people are dot, dot, dot. And I said, Look, let me stop you, son. I understand the anger you can't categorize all white people as dot, dot, dot. And I just started naming our friends, Auntie Nikki and Uncle Adam and Bobby and Heather Conway and McLean Wilson and a host of others. So I want you to understand these are people we've been living in close community with. The idea that proximity breeds empathy is very real. What does your dinner table look like? One of, my, one of my best friends is a guy who grew up very wealthy, actually here in the state of Tennessee, and went off to grad school, then started a business on the East Coast, and then was going to come back home to run the family business. And he says, my mother's dream was that we would all be seated together on the same pew at this church, which happened to be an all-white church. And man, he says, man, God's just been stirring some things in his heart. And so he says, man, it's a little awkward. I just started looking at my relationships and just realized that they were pretty much homogenous. He says, I, I, I can't explain it outside of the spirit of God and what he was doing in my heart. He says, I literally just began with praying God, would you just send some people into my life who are just ethnically different? And that's how our relationship started. That's how it started. He approached me and we're hanging out and doing life and then, then that kind of leads to, to duck hunting. And then, you know, he's wanting me to go on a hike with him. I had to stop him there. I tell him black people, we don't really like hike. That's just not like walk up the mountain. Like that's just typically not how we how we roll. Um, there's a lot of stories that you understand black people ain't got nothing to do with, like man gets mauled by bear. You've never heard of Tyrone in your life getting mauled by a bear. I anyways, I digress. But he stretched me in a certain direction, and I've stretched him in a certain direction, and our lives are the richer for it because this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please notice all of this stuff is threaded back into the gospel. If God so loved the world, 
that he sent his only son. And if Jesus Christ died for the world, then may our relationships reflect that. Why do we do all this as we end? We do it all because Paul tells us in verse 15, the work of Jesus Christ abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself, hear it, one new man. Paul is writing in a language called Greek and there's a lot of different words for new in the Greek. One Greek word for new is, um, is the word neos. Neos simply speaks of something new as it relates to time. Uh, it, would be the, it would be the latest kind of MacBook Pro. It would be the 2022 Chevy Tahoe. It would, it would be the latest um, 757 jet to come off the assembly line. That's neos. It's, it's something that is new as it relates to time. That's not the word Paul uses. He uses a different word. It's the, it's the word kainos, K-A-I-N-O-S. Kainos doesn't speak of something new as it relates to time. It speaks of something new as it relates to kind. It's the idea of invention. It's something so new, people don't have a category for it. So that while neos is the 2022 Chevy Tahoe, kainos is, is Henry Ford's Model T. While Neos is um, the latest MacBook Pro, Kynos is the first computer. And while Neos is the latest 757 jet to come off the assembly line, Kynos is the Wright Brothers. Can you just imagine going to Kitty Hawk Beach in the early 1900s and you're seeing this thing in the air and then you come home and someone's like, what is it like? You don't know how to explain that. You have no category for it. Mind blown. That's the word Paul uses for the coming together of Jew and Gentiles, various ethnicities, under the lordship of Jesus Christ within the local church. Do you know in the first century world, the only place you could go seeing people of different ethnicities have substantive relationships was the church mind blown. Church of the city, are your campuses blowing people's minds? Church of the city, are your, are your dinner tables, are your relationships blowing people's minds. I'll never forget, I, um, I was preaching one Sunday at a, at a church I was pastoring at the time, actually in Memphis, and you could always tell first time African Americans at our church. Um, our, our church tradition, um, Typically, the traditional black church is a lot more formal, and so first-time African-Americans who would come to our multi-ethnic church in Memphis, they would come, as we would say, suited and booted. After service, I'm down front, and I'm shaking hands, and this 80-something-year-old woman comes up to me, big old church hat, black woman, and she squeezes my hand with all of her octogenarian strength. She's got a tear streaming down her cheeks. She says, young man, I grew up in this city. I was a domestic. I was the help. I, I was here when Dr. King was assassinated. I, I remember the curfews, she said. I'll never forget her. She says, I remember race relations just always being horrific. And I remember late 60s, early 70s, beginning to pray a prayer. Lord, would you build a church that comes against this demonic stronghold of racism. And again, with all the strength she could muster and tears flowing down her face, she says, young man, you're an answer to these prayers. I don't say that to make myself the hero. But there's something about the church exemplifying not just the gospel preached, but the gospel practiced. And when the gospel is practiced, it transgresses all kinds of tribal lines. We 
because that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. What are we asking for, Church of the City? We are asking, among other things, that these three locations would reach all of their missions field, mission fields with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be visibly displayed across a multi-ethnic cohort where we're tearing down lines. Yes, that's, that's the legacy and the aspirations of Dr. King, but that's not original to King, way before King. It's the gospel. As we close our time together, I can think of no better way to end our time than by preparing for communion. So right now, I, I know the Spirit's been speaking, and I want us to just prepare ourselves. In fact, from 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul is just talking about communion, he, it's as if he says, I want everything to stop, and I, I, I want people to, to examine themselves. I've got some good news and bad news for you when it comes to communion. The bad news is, is that communion isn't for just any person. Communion is actually for people who have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, who, who have experienced what we've been talking about, especially in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, that they've been saved by grace through faith. While the bad news is, for some of you, you might go, okay, that's me. I'm not a follower of Jesus Christ. The good news is you can become a follower of Jesus Christ today. And all that demands is acknowledging that you, like, like me, like everyone else, that we're sinners. In fact, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just not to remind us of our sins, but to forgive us of our sins cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right now, we can, we can submit and yield the totality of our lives to him. We can receive his grace. So I want to just give you a moment. If that's you right now, no matter where you are, you may be at home, you may be in a sanctuary, wherever you may be, all you must do is to cry out to God and acknowledge that, God, I am a sinner. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ as the only payment for my sin. I receive your grace and mercy now. Make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. I got some more bad news. You may be a follower of Jesus Christ, but 1 Corinthians 11 is clear. If you are living and walking in known sin, communion isn't for you. The good news is right now you can take some moments to confess your sin, repent of your sin, and receive the same grace that saved you and allow that to wash over you. So I want to give you a few moments now as you reflect what is the Spirit saying, what areas of your life are you living in sin. I love how the psalmist says it, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me. Why don't you confess those things to God? Well, the night when Jesus was betrayed, it says that he took bread and he blessed it, broke it, he gave it, saying, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Shall we all eat together? Likewise, the Bible says he, he took the cup. Now, he was with his Jewish followers and they thought they were celebrating the Passover and they assumed that Jesus was going to say that this is the blood of that Passover lamb. But then Jesus throws a curveball. He says, I am that lamb, the lamb who has come to take away the sins of the world. The writer of Hebrews would say, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Shall we all drink together? So Father, we leave encouraged. The 
is not a political deal. This is not an ideology. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for Church of the City and their amazing work. We pray, Father, for a harvest of souls, an onslaught of disciples being built up, and that this would be a multi-ethnic expression of our future eternal reality because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, who died for the world. In Jesus' name.